putting the shades on. For the, <laughs> all right, we'll put the shades on. Let's go. Let's do that. <coughs> all right, welcome back to the Maven Experience. I've got my guy here, Mike Purcell. We're here, baby. So we got Mike in the house. Mike's a freaking beast. So he's been working with us for he just finished his first summer. First summer, yep. Rookie. Top rookie. Not just rookie. Some would say. Top rookie. Okay, we're gonna get into it. Um, super excited to talk to Mike. He's uh from the East Coast. We're gonna get into that a little bit. North. Chicago. North. Yeah. Nor- North. Midwest. Same thing. Midwest. All the same thing. So you achieved some pretty cool milestones this year for someone first fresh coming into the door door space um how much did you end up making this year in total i made right under 90 um so really i mean i'd never seen that kind of money before i I didn't know that that was even possible i was gonna say you just yeah it made like ninety thousand dollars yeah about ninety thousand does that still feel kind of weird to say that that's Um, how much money you made when I put myself into my shoes about eight months ago, yeah, it does feel weird. But when I sit here now, it's like just the the rewards that come from taking risks that we all took this summer or that I was first to take this summer. It's like you look back and you think, why didn't I ever think to take more risks in the past? You know, I mean, if the money's out there, you can go get it. So it was pretty cool to see that. And it, it still feels a little bit crazy, but I'd say – once your perspective changes on how much you can make and once you see real money, um, it doesn't feel like a whole lot anymore, especially when you're surrounded by big dogs too. So. Dude, 100%. So a couple things you said there. Take freaking risk. Mm-hmm. How many kids are in their 20s and they're still playing it safe? I'd say about 90% of kids in their 20s are playing it safe. I mean, you look at the way that our country is designed, it's just like four years of high school, four years of college, and then really four years of work until you can negotiate what you kind of want, right? So, I mean, in our space, it's like we don't want to wait for for 12, even 12 years. I mean, it's a long time. We want to go get it now. So um, I'd say advice to anybody out there that is in their 20s, just take a risk, whatever it may be, you know. Whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Anything. Because it's crazy that I think a lot of kids are scared to take risk. And I think a lot of it has to do with their parents, the influence of their parents. Maybe their parents got burned in the past. Or, if, or maybe their parents took risk and failed. Right. And so they they want to prevent their kids from experiencing failure and experiencing pain. Yeah. Because our parents love us, right? My parents, I know they love me. They want, they want what's best for me. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of times our parents can be helicopter parents where they're just hovering over us, trying to make sure that we don't trip, we don't fall. And then now, not even helicopter parents, they're called snowplow parents. Snowplow parents. Because they are plowing away any obstacle out of their kid's way so they oh. don't feel or experience anything. And now these kids that are been raised by snowplow parents, their anxiety is higher than it's ever been. Their mental health isn't good because they've never had to experience any type of difficulty growing up. And they're not ready for the real world. They get out right. to college. They get out to um, real life, and they don't. they can't handle it no. because now their parents aren't there to plow away all of the obstacles right. that are sitting in front of them. So, well, I mean, I think that I think that's a problem with our generation alone because I think our parents all had it a little bit. Not, I wouldn't say rough growing up, but they had to work for everything they got. You know, it's a typical nine to five generation. They all go out and they get paid. They come home. They want it better for their kids. But I think the way that our parents have been raised can influence how we continue to be raised because they want it better for us. Mm-hmm. So they want us to take the right route in their head, you know? Right. But right. growing up in an era of social media, you see all these people out here getting it. And you're like, dude, I don't want to go to I'm I had to catch myself there. I was about to say <laughs> I don't <laughs> I don't want to go to college. There's people out here getting money. There's people out here getting things that I want. There's people out here that have things I want, you know? There's no reason to sit around and wait. I think you're right. I think it's a different it's a the way that we can generate income in this generation is completely different from way different two generations ago. Yeah, it's like a whole new world. It's a whole new world. Yeah, whole new world. world. Um, It's like, it's like trying to explain to, yeah, it's just a whole new world. I mean, you take, if you were to go to your grandparents and try to explain to them like how Bitcoin works and what Bitcoin is, they're like fairyland. They have no idea. Their brains would explode. They they can't comprehend what it is. So I think when our parents try to give us advice financial advice for this day and age um 
I just think they don't have the education or knowledge to really give proper advice. Now, not I'm not saying no like financial right. advice. No, I agree. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. the the pathway that we can generate money in this generation is like you said, it's just completely different. Yeah. Don't have world. to go to college to be financially stable these days. No, now, is no. the probability is there some stability in 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 extended education? Of course. One hundred percent. But is it the only route to success? No, and I think that's the problem because I think everybody knows out there that that is always a route, and that is always the route that most people tend to take. And you're not wrong for going that route. I don't want that to ever come off that way because I think there's a lot of people out there that go and get a degree, they change the world. But for kids that are kind of lost, that were in my position, where you just go to school because your parents tell you, hey, you should go to school, and you know, you're 18 years old, you have no idea what to do. You just came out of high school, you've been told what to do your whole life. Now you get to make decisions, or you think your parents do. But <laughs> and then you get to school, and you're like, why am I even here? I don't find any of this stuff that I'm majoring in interesting. And I've learned most of this stuff in the past. And do I really want a career in this for the rest of my life? I think you should never settle down with one career until you know and you've tried everything else out and you say, okay, this is something I really want to do versus being forced down one stream and then you're locked into it and then you think there's no way out. So I think take chances early on, you know? Amen. Because what will happen is, I mean, you think about it, if you were to be four, in your 40s and you're not happy with where you're at, um, maybe you're married, maybe you got, you know, a couple kids and you want to put yourself in a better financial situation right. – now you go take risk, and now you swing for the fences. And if you don't make it, now who's affected? It's your Everyone. wife. It's your yeah. kids. There's there's way more at stake at that level of life. Where in your twenties, man, if you if you swing big and you miss, it doesn't matter. Keep guess swinging. what? You're next up at bat again. Exactly. Swing again. Just keep swinging. <laughs> keep swinging, man. Yeah. And, and what's crazy is in the right vehicles and the right opportunities, you're bound to knock one out of the park. That's for sure. I mean, that's so, a fact. It's a fact. So for all the 20-year-olds out there, like if you're in your 20s, guys, take some f- risk, man. You like, miss 100% of the shots you don't take. It's corny, but it's true. It's facts. Take your shots. It is facts. So growing up in Chicago, yep. what was childhood like for you? Um, I would say I'm trying to find the right word to describe it. Um, it was normal. I mean, for me, we had – I had a good upbringing, you know, I never really had to go through too many hardships. Um, Obviously, I was too young when all that, the recession, all that kind of stuff happened. Mm. Um, Everybody got hit by that. My family did as well. But it's just like, you know, they kept moving. Um, I grew up in a household with two parents that worked nonstop. Um, They would do whatever they could to provide. And you look back on it now and you're appreciative of it. But you kind of feel guilty almost as if you robbed them from some of their freedom, you know. Mm. So... Um, so yeah, middle, I had middle two class, sisters. Middle yeah, class. middle class, yeah. middle class. I got two sisters, one older, one younger. Um, older sister graduated. She got her med degree, so she's off doing whatever in a hospital right now. Nice. Um, little sister's out in San Francisco. She'll probably be a brain <laughs> surgeon. She's super smart. And I'm the door-to-door salesman. So. <laughs> You're the entrepreneur of the family. That's right, yeah. My dad was in sales his whole life. Um, I just found out this year that he was the rookie of the year when he was coming into sales, too. Nice. So it's cool to see that and cool to see some similarities, but also weird seeing how similar things can really be, you know? Yeah. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, I guess not. So what type of sales did your dad do? Uh, he was in more cleaning supply sales, I guess, like going out and getting contracts with restaurants and buildings and providing them commercial, um, commercial sales and then just stocking them up every single month. So the world revolves around sales. It does. Yeah. Once you're in it, you see it everywhere. Everything is, I mean, somebody sold the furniture that we're sitting in right now. Right. Somebody sold the building that we're in. Somebody Somebody sold me these sunglasses. Sales (laughs) makes the world go round. So if you have a bad stigma about sales, I mean, it is sales. Sales is what uh, keeps us here. I think it's more or less people just need to understand sales. I think a lot of people think of sales as in like the 90s gimmicky. They've seen the Wolf of Wall Street. Like and they pushy think, sales yeah. guy. Yeah. And obviously there's those people out there and we can all tend to get that way if, if it comes to it. But the one thing about sales is if you can just be decent at it, you can navigate your way through life so much easier. You've read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, Carney. Yep. Mm-hmm. A great book. I mean... Just teaches you how to communicate with people and 100%. and in sales, it's you're what you're doing is you're 
hopefully providing some type of value to somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's an exchange of money that usually happens when, when right. that happens. So, um, yeah, freaking love it. So take me through high school. Did you kind of, were you in this stage where you're like, Hey, I don't know what I want to do for work. I, my dad was in sales. My sisters are doing medical school. Like what, at what point of your kind of upbringing were you starting to think about, you know, what I want to be when I grow up. Cause you know, like that in school, what do you want to be when you grow up, Tommy? Right. And he's like, I want to be a fireman, you know? Right. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> right. Do you remember uh, having that I actually got asked this the other day and I was like, man, I don't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Like it, it you just didn't know sure it. wasn't, it for sure wasn't a door to door salesman. I mean, I, I never right. sat there and I was like, oh yeah, I want to go knock on doors for a living. But growing up, I always wanted to be, I just want to be someone who had the things I wanted. I never really knew what I'd do to get there, but I knew that I had to do something. So um, I tried a lot when I was young. I've been working since I was 15, um, worked in a pizza place, um, just took orders, knew how to talk to people, communicate. I just kept having jobs, working around service industry stuff. Uh, once I graduated high school, I then had an offer to go play football. Uh, it wasn't a big school. It was a D2 school up in Illinois, but I just wanted to be close to home. Yeah. Uh, Don Beebe, shout out if you're out there. <laughs> Don Beebe, head coach, Aurora football. Um, most rings in NFL history, I believe. Damn. So to get an offer from you as a receiver, I appreciate it. Um, but I just backed out of it about two weeks before because I was like, I don't want to play football for the rest of my life. I think mm -hmm. this is just something I'm committing to just because I need something to commit to, right? Yeah. So I was like, let me get out of this. I ended up going to Texas Tech, rushed my way in over there. Um, that didn't last long. Came home after a month and a half, dropped out. And I was just like, man, things are going south, you know? Mm. Three months later, COVID hits. Things are really going south. Wow. Yeah, you're at home. Your parents, everybody's in the same house under the same roof. You're the college dropout. You're living at home, freeloading, you know. You're like, what is life right now? Right, exactly. You know, The world's you, ending. Yeah, you get broken up with. The world's ending. COVID's happening. You're stuck at home. It's just like everything's falling apart, right? So mm -hmm. um, in those moments, it was just a lot of persistence, just believing that I can still do something. Luckily, we lived in Texas, so you could still have somewhat freedom to go out and work. Yeah. Um, I was able to keep a job at a golf course, Glen Eagles, mm -hmm. and I would just serve snacks over there all day. Um, after that... Kept working kind of deadbeat jobs, just stuff where I could get by, get enough money. I ended up giving school another shot. Went to UNT last year. I like UNT. Denton, awesome. That school is amazing. Um, I'm just convinced college is not for me because yeah. I enjoy being there, but just mm -hmm. being in those classes and being in that environment wasn't really up my alley. So I was uh, skipping class, and I was working at a restaurant over here in Frisco at the Star Snowbird, and I was calling my buddies just to kind of get them in the door for brunch. We just opened a new brunch thing, mm -hmm. and it was struggling. Nobody was coming in. So I was like, I'm going to call everybody I know on my phone, <laughs> get them up hey, here. Hey, come get some grub. That's right. Give them free food, and then uh, just take care of me, and we'll, we'll get it taken care of. So made a few calls. Nobody picked up. And then I got a call back from my buddy one night, and I asked, we just catching up, you know, typical stuff. We hadn't talked in a while. He goes, yeah, I'm working for this company called Vivint. Um, I just got the job about a month ago at sales. And I'd worked with him in sales at LA Fitness before. And I'm like, mm. oh, I'm like, here we go. I'm like, here we go. Sales again. Let's see how this goes. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I'll come by. Whatever. Came up to the office. Um, I did not understand the dress code here. Uh -huh. I came in a polo, uh, slacks, and dress shoes. Oh, you're looking good. Yeah. And just for everybody <laughs> watching, like, people come to the office looking like me, looking like Trent, just yeah, like just hoodie, chill. just chill, you know? Yeah. yeah. I pull up looking like I'm trying to sell you a contract to like <laughs> buy mattresses or something. I don't know what I was wearing. I was like, okay, whatever. Everybody looked at me crazy. And uh, That's how most people go to like a job interview, you know? You look yeah, part, exactly. Look I mean, dress for the job you want. So yeah. I was like, I'm going to show up looking good. Came in, met the guys, met Russ, um, Josh, all the guys that I'm super close with now, my brothers. And I remember I ran into you too. And I was like, who's this? And you're like, oh, that's Trent. And I was like, he works here? They're like, yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, maybe I should get to know people a little bit better because yeah, I didn't yeah. know anything. Right. But um, they sold me easily. I was like, these guys are telling me I can go out in a <laughs> summer and I can make upwards of fifty thousand dollars. I have nothing here. I'm, I'm going broke. I don't I barely have a job. I'm not going to school. I'm going to have loans. I, I got to take it. You know, I was like, they, they they didn't force me into it. But it's like a guy in my position, a guy that a lot of people's positions that they're in right now. You got to take this job. Mm hmm. Took it, uh, knocked one door here, and then we went out for summer, and it was just uh, it changed my life for sure. So before we get into that, I'm always curious. So okay, so yeah. you so you come here, you meet the guys, and they're like, bro, you can go 
knock on doors, sell shit, yeah, make fifty thousand bucks, and you're like, eh, what? Were you a little skeptical at first? Oh, for sure. Like, eh. I'm looking at it like, dude, this is every Instagram DM I've ever got in my life. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, you want to get some fast money? And I'm so like, life oh. insurance. Yeah, right. I'm like, here we go. I mean, I I don't want to do this because I'm a little scared. But at the right. same time, you you feel the people around you. Yeah. What made you feel more confident about it? I would say just the influences that I was surrounded with in the building. Um, Pat, first of all, I knew Pat wouldn't invite me to something. If, if you guys didn't know, I guess now the name's out there. Patrick Berg, he's the one that got me over to Vivint. Um, whenever he brought me in, I trusted Pat. So I was like, I trust Pat, so I have to trust the people that he's with right now, just right. For, for the time being. And when we sat down and started talking, um, Rush just connected with me on a human level. You know, He wasn't like, hey, this is all about money. He's like, this is about your freedom. You know, you go out, you earn your freedom, you get away from everything that you know. And me being, I, I take chances a lot. So I was like, I can get away from everything that's going bad for me right now. And I have nothing to lose. And then all they had to do was really tell me like, hey, we're going to Cleveland this summer. Magically, my dad just happened to be up in Cleveland working up there. And that's where his second kind of primary location is. His no secondary way. location. Yeah, Cleveland. So I, I was like, that. that's awesome. I was like, this happens, and then I run into a few other things, and just the ways of the universe, just telling you, like, hey, it's funneling you towards one thing. You're <laughs> yeah. like, I can't fight it, you know? <clears throat> so I think just them being real with me and sitting me down and having an honest conversation, I think that's what sold me. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. So now how did your parents react when you're like, hey, I'm going to go to Cleveland for the summer, deuces? Scam. <laughs> so you're about to get scammed. You yep. need to stay home. Don't do this. This sounds like a bad idea. Take a secure job. Take a secure job. We have opportunities here. You have plenty of opportunities. You know a bunch of people. And the one thing that, because it was more my mom than my dad, because my dad had been around it, and he's like, if this is the route that he's going to take, he's going to take it, yep. and he's going to have to kill it. But my mom was more like, no, you need to stay home. I'm her only son, right? So yeah, she wanted yeah. me to be close to her. Yeah, All yeah. my sisters are gone. She needed, she needed me around. Right. And I was like... If I stay here, what everybody that I know right now that you're saying, I know all these people that can get me jobs, where have they been and where are they going to get me? Because right now I'm still in the same position that I don't want to be in. And I think that's when she realized, like, oh, it, it might not be a good idea for him to stay here. Maybe he does need to go. Yeah. And I had, her, I had talks with her. I had talks with both my parents. And I broke it down to him in a way that if I come back and I have nothing, I'll work as hard as I can. I'll work seven days a week and get money back in my account, and I'll take a chance. And if I fight, if I fail, I fail. If I fall, I fall. You know, so um, it took a little convincing, but they were definitely skeptical at first. And as I started to kind of show them the culture that I was pretty much getting embedded in, I was like, "This is the one that I got to take." And they were like, "This is something that you should take too." By the time it was to go, I was like, "I just got to do it." And they were like, "If you're gonna do it, do it." So that's awesome. Yeah, did it. So, um, and you did say you did go out and get a couple sales before the summer. You had some, you went on a blitz, um, like so a preseason blitz or how did you do that? They were just knocking on Fridays and Saturdays because oh, right. I got recruited like March 20th. Like I'm Ooh. talking, we, yeah, we leave in four right. weeks for Cleveland. <laughs> right and, before. Uh, yeah. Like, I don't know what's going on, but I was, I should probably <laughs> do something to see if I like even know what I'm doing out here. You yeah, know? yeah. So I went to, I got assigned a neighborhood, went out there, um, Walked around, didn't really know what I was doing, just kind of talked to people. Mm -hmm. um, got in a few houses my first day, so I was like, okay. I mean, this it's not impossible, you know. Mm -hmm. Called Josh, and due to some things, we couldn't get a few things done. But um, the next day, went out, just kept my head high, and talked to a few customers, got an upgrade. And I uh, felt pretty accomplished, but I was like, there's a lot more to do. I mean, it's, it's just a little upgrade, you know. So right. um, felt good getting a taste of that before we left, though, just so I kind of knew how it feels to be in that environment and how it feels to get something closed. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And we left like two weeks later. And you're like, okay, here we go. Said goodbye to the fam. Yeah. And um, how did it, How did your first month go as a rookie? You'd seen an upgrade. You hadn't seen a ton of deals closed yet. Right. What was your learning curve like that first month? And how did yeah? How did that go? First month was weird. Like it, it was it was unlike anything that I'd ever been a part of. Because first of all, you pack your car and you leave stuff at home, you're leaving everybody, you're just leaving your normal life. You know, it feels like you're taking off out of a rocket ship, you're leaving everybody behind. You're like, okay. Um, you get up there, 18-hour drive, you get settled into an apartment, and two days later, you start. And you're sitting there like, oh, my God. It's like pregame <laughs> jitters, you know. You're sitting yeah. there like your stomach's kind of uneasy. You kind of go to the bathroom, you kind of don't, but you're like, oh, we got to go. So 
first day we get in the car, we drive out to the area, 42 degrees, rain slash sleet. Um, nobody's home. It's like 2 p.m. I don't. I barely even have a vivid shirt. Like I'm just out there. I have a. I have a tiny little. One of Josh's old on. shirts. Oh yeah. yeah. No yeah. It had holes in it, stains on it. I'm like oh jeez. So I'm just walking around, just knocking on doors. It's freezing cold outside, and I check my watch because I feel like it's probably about 8:15 at this point. It's starting to get dark. I'm like oh my god. I'm getting tired. I'm hungry. It's six o'clock. I'm like it is not 8:15. I've only been out here for like three hours. <laughs> yeah. So. First day, you get picked up on a bagel. You don't sell anything. You get in like two doors. Don't even get close to getting a deal. You're like, oh, my God, what did I do? Like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> and then you get in the car and you realize that other people had the same days. Mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm not alone in this. And then you get back and you have a recap at night. And you realize that nobody knows how to sell in this market. And you're like, oh, so we're all on the same page here. So it's not me falling behind. We all need to learn how to sell up here. So that's when I was committed because I was like, it's not just me. Yeah, yeah. These guys have been doing this for 10 years. If Russ Smoot tells me we need to sit down and devise a plan to sell in this market because we don't know how to, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to stick it out because we're all going to learn together and we're all going to grow. Right. So my learning curve really began whenever we started these night trainings because we'd all come back every day, fresh, everything on our mind. We'd get it all out there, what we dealt with. And props to our managers because they would stay up late, 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 just helping us out to make sure we were successful. Yeah. Um, I would say that my learning curve was a little bit more accelerated than most of the rookies in the company, just because I'd been around sales before. My dad's been in sales his whole life. I used to sit in on his calls. So I knew how to speak to people, you know, the matter of knowing the information that I have to tell them was the biggest problem for me. So once I learned everything about our products and then how to kind of get into a flow state, that's when I started rolling, but it, it didn't come instantaneously. I did four my first week. Um, apparently that was really good. And I made the broadcast. I was tied with Eli Randall. Or no, what's his name? Uh, is it Eli Jack? He's in Greensboro. Blonde kid. I, can't I think Eli Jackson. That's his name. But we tied that week. And then I was like, oh, maybe I can get good at this. You know, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm that guy. Yeah. And then we go out there week two, and it's just like a bomb went off in my neighborhood. It's, and nothing was going right. I was like, <laughs> this is insane. I go out there. I don't sell anything till Thursday. And it was like a baby, baby, baby deal. And I see that I only did two on the week that week. And it was just like, oh, man, you really got to, like, keep trying to get better in this because you're never going to do enough until you, like, keep pushing yourself past those limits you're comfortable with. So next week I got a little bit more uncomfortable and still only did, like, four. And then week four I popped off for, like, 12. Um, and Damn. that week I was like, okay, this is how it's supposed to look. Yeah, my mind was blown because you just check – everything you see how much money you've made that week you see how much you're getting paid the next friday you're like dude i've never had a check over twelve hundred dollars before yeah. i'm getting paid four grand next week up front <laughs> and then you're telling me you're paying me again in what was it, october yeah you're paying me on a back end in october i was like we can get rolling with this so so your level of what your your mental cap financial cap was just lifted oh yeah you're it, like okay yeah. boom sky's the limit let's yep. freaking go just a rocket shot off through it because <laughs> i was like there there is no ceiling anymore but mm -hmm. the only ceiling that you then have is how hard you want to work yep. and if you're willing to keep trying to do more and more because the main thing with our job is once you're doing well people get complacent mm -hmm. you can't get complacent the money the money eventually gets to where you're comfortable right right and so yeah that's the challenge in 100%. I mean, that's sense. the whole reason we do it, right? Because we don't want to be comfortable. We don't want to be those people that have secure everything. Mm -hmm. Once you get comfortable, that's your enemy. Comfort. It's the poison. Exactly. It's the poison, it's poison of sales. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's and it's how and it, that's what's it's crazy, but yeah, I would say complacency is the number one killer too. For sure. Hitting that top 1% level, For sure. right? So, um, how did you battle complacency because all of a sudden you got a check that's 4 grand. Right. And I've seen it. You've seen it. A kid gets a four thousand dollar paycheck, and bro bagels the next week. Oh right? yeah, no. Like, yeah. and he walks in the office. He's got a new MacBook. Yep, that's right. He's got new Yeezys on. <laughs> new like, Yeezys, new AirPods. The money's gone. Yep, it's so, gone. So how did you? What did you mentally do to help yourself stay grounded and realize four thousand dollars isn't shit? I money was a big thing for me at first because i was like okay i went up to cleveland with like four hundred dollars in my bank account so it was like i sold everything i had i sold tv entertainment center dresser fridge all this stuff you're all in yeah i was just moving everything because i was like i need money so i can go up there and have some some kind of money we go to walmart a few stores i'm all the way down to 300 by the time we get rolling so 
money at that point, I never really had a whole lot of it because I just blew it. So I was like, I'm not even really concerned about the money. I just want to go see if I can do this job. So whenever I made that kind of money, I then looked at it like, okay, am I going to sit here and be comfortable with it? Or am I going to be the guy that's had my eyes glued to the leaderboard since week one? And I see people that are still ahead of me. So I was like, I need to go hunt these guys down. I, the money I can do whatever I want with, I need to hunt them down and I need to get more money. Because I don't want to be on that leaderboard in fourth place, fifth place, because I know what I can do, right? So battling complacency for me was really just keeping my eyes on the leaderboard and wanting to be at the top and just being hungry to compete. And then little competitions that I think Vivint's a great company because they have those competitions that keep you really, really hungry and engaged. And they give you cool stuff on like this hoodie. <laughs> this came from a competition. So swagged it's like, out. Swagged out. Yeah, you get paid. But the <clears> thing <throat> is, it's about so much more than money because it is competing every single day to become a better version of yourself. And you're competing against other guys in the company that you have no idea who they are. You don't know what they're out there doing. So you have to go out and you have to put up enough numbers to show people, hey, I'm doing this too. There's going to be a competition this year. Like it's You're not going to have number one unless you work for it because I'm working too. Right. And I think the people that were at the top of the leaderboard all had that same mentality. Yeah. I think you I think you hit a spot on because if you're just working for the money, then eventually you're going to cap yourself out. Yeah. So you, you shifted from, hey, I'm not paying attention to the bank account anymore. Bank account's good. Right. I'm looking at like being the best. How do I how do I get to the top of the leaderboards um, and chase that guy down? Yeah. Right. 100%. And, and be at the top. And then mm -hmm. because you did that, the money just followed. For sure. Yeah, it so. will. If you work hard, you know, the money comes. So were you pretty consistent through the whole summer? Did you have any dips or like any any tough points in the summer that you can look back on? And oh, be like, for sure. This is a hard week specifically or a hard day. Can you can you go back and internalize any any tough spots? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there were a lot of tough spots throughout the summer because the one thing with this job is it's rewarding, but the most reward comes from the most doing the most stuff you don't want to do, right? So it's like whenever you get to a certain bomb. point. Truth bomb. Truth Boom. bomb. Facts. <laughs> Throw a bomb feature in there, a little bomb sound effect, yeah, something. But um, the tough points that I dealt with were mostly just mental um, because that's all it is, this job. It's all mental. I mean, you just have to have your head in the right space and you got to stay level. So I would say the hard parts for me were when you would get too high or when you would get too low on yourself. Because if, you if you think you're him because you went out and you had a good week, the next week it's not going to be easy because you're going to go out there with that mentality and confidence will either – make you skyrocket with deals. You do the McGregor walk yeah, down you're the doing road. the McGregor walk down the street and they're looking at you like, who is that guy? Yeah. So confidence is either going to sell for you or it's not going to sell for you if you're being too confident, you almost being egotistical. Like too, yeah, like too, con yeah. Yeah, too cocky. Yeah. So the main tough points that I ran into, we went to a nice neighborhood in Ohio. They all made a bunch of money. It was kind of like, hey, we're too good for you guys. You don't need to try and sell us anything. Um, at that point, I realized that I wasn't a Swiss Army knife yet. I was like, I can't even sell these guys. And we were all going through it, but you look at yourself, you go, why can't I do it? Mm -hmm. I know other guys aren't doing it either, but I should be able to do it. So trying to overcome that, but also realizing that it's not all on you. Sometimes it's just where you're at. It actually is. Because a lot of things about this job, it's like most people will say, oh, it's not where you're at. It's the person who's in it. But sometimes it really can be where you're at. So where we were at, that kind of hit me. I kind of hit a wall right there. But whenever you get to a certain area, I think I think you just have to get out and get going because that was another tough point of mine. Sometimes I just linger. I'd be like, uh, I'd be picky with doors and stuff like that. Right. I think whenever I just said to F the it. wind, I'm just going <clears> to <throat> go yeah. for it. Right. And you would just go for every single thing that you see. I think that's when you start getting rewarded because work ethic means that you have reward coming if you work hard enough. So the tough points were definitely mental. But once you overcome those obstacles, just by kind of pushing through it rather than trying to go around it, you start to realize that your obstacles aren't so tough as you think they are. You know, yeah. just got to get through them. That's awesome. And you realized you get to a neighborhood that's like a little bit more upper class. And yeah. You're like, you're like, wait a minute. I need to up my skill set, right? Figure out. Because yeah. I think the best mindset to have in sales is I can sell any person. I just need to learn how to sell each person. Right. Learn the different personality traits, because mm -hmm. um, what a lot of guys do, and, and they're victims to this, is um, they become victims to the hood, right? Yeah. The neighborhood. Yeah. And they blame, oh, I can't sell in this type of neighborhood, or this type of customer is not going to buy from me, or whatever it is. And th that's just all mental. It's mental, and mental it'll kill blocks. you. It'll, it'll kill, kill you. you. Yeah. It'll kill you. It's it's a cancer in the sales game, and so instead of saying, I need a different neighborhood, or I need to switch hoods all the time, you need to you need to say, hey. 
I can sell anybody anywhere, anytime. 100%. I just need to learn how to sell each type of person. Yeah, you got to look Middle internally. class, upper class, lower class. Yeah, For sure. Like, you got to look at yourself in those moments because you look around you and you want to blame everything else. Most of the time when you're doing that, there's something inside of you that's making you blame everything else, right? Yeah, so lack of confidence or whatever. Exactly, yeah. Just look in the mirror and say, you know what? Maybe this is on me and I just need to improve and I need to figure out how I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Love it. Okay, so summer ends. You freaking destroyed it. $90,000. I, I got to ask now because mom was a little skeptical. You come home. Yeah. How does that, how does that play out? Um, It was interesting, honestly, for a minute because – was she kind of mad you did good? Because now she's like, ah, oh, he's going to go. A little <laughs> bit. Yeah, they were a little bit like, I wouldn't say they were mad because they were super, super happy for me. Yeah, like my right, parents, right. I know what you mean by that. But yeah, my parents yeah, were not mad. Yeah, they're super supportive of me. But the one thing that I did notice is, yeah, they were kind of like that because they were like, I went against their advice yeah. and I succeeded. So it's kind of that moral like dilemma of, wow, my son did good, but I told him to stay here and he didn't listen to me. So it's like, hmm. Now he's gonna big dog me. And I was like, yeah, I was, that's what I'm gonna do. I made sure I got him a little something when I got back. So yeah, yeah. Take and care they're and him, yeah, no, they're and they're proud of us, right? Like for sure. Because and that's good. And maybe it helps them understand, like, hey, there's, you know, we need to put a little bit more trust or faith into our kids and yeah. let them let them go try and let them fail, man. Let exactly. them fail. Let, let them your grow. kids fail. Oh my gosh. Rule number one. Best thing you could do for your kids is let them go fail. Let yep. them figure it out. Because, like, yeah, if we're helicopter parents or snowplow parents, man, it's you're. You're protecting them from growth. Yeah. You're not, you're not protecting them from pain um, of failure. You're protecting them from growth. That's you're stopping fact. your kids from growing. That's a fact. Um, and man, put your kids in put your kids in the hardest positions possible early on. Right. And they will they'll crush life. I would say that is crush one thing I would thank my parents for. If I were to tell them, it'd be just like you guys weren't so so honed in on me that I did have some freedom and independence. So I would learn a lot of myself. Like I said, I was working yeah. from a young age, and I think that is like the biggest. That's the biggest benefit to kids is just being able to go out and get a job and just learning a little bit of how the real world works. Right. Because your parents have their own perception. You need to have your own perception. You can't have theirs in your head because it'll just screw with you, right? Yeah. So get out and figure it out. Yeah, it can't be, you know, buy your kids everything. No. Like my parents growing up were well off, right? Mm -hmm. But if I wanted a new pair of basketball shoes, I'd have to go mow, mow a couple lawns right. on Saturdays, you Arno. know? I'd have to go do that. And so – Teaching teaching your kids the the value of the dollar, yeah, which is going down. Another, yeah, another topic. Not so, yeah. <laughs> but Bitcoin kids, Bitcoin. teach them how to work, right? Teach yeah. them how to work. Teach them how to go out there and, and get what they want and um, love that dude. So now, sure. so what's your game plan now, man? So you're going into your second summer. Second summer, yeah. Um, what's your what's your goals? What's your what's getting you excited to keep going? I want to crush it, dude. I mean the the one thing is from last year you see the accolades that you can achieve and you're like, okay, this is nice. You know, you get a little trophy and all that kind of stuff. But when you go to Vegas and you have all the leaderboards of everybody in the comp or everybody in evolution on display, everybody can see them mm -hmm. and you see your name in third and then you see other guys at the top and you see the hype videos they make for them. They got to drive around in Ferraris, you know, <laughs> and, and you just sit there and you go, man, you know, maybe I should have gone a little bit harder. <laughs> There's a new level. There's yeah, always another level. There's always another level. So my thing is just really getting uncomfortable with myself this off season, um, pushing myself to do things that I absolutely despise, and just trying to better myself in every way that I can. And I think whenever I get out to summer, um, I went out there lost last year mentally. So if I go out there focused and really know what I'm capable of and just be ready to push it to the next level, I want to go out and I want to do a certain number of accounts that nobody on our team has done yet. So if I can do that, uh, when I do that, manifest it, right? Let's go. When I do that, it's going to be uh, same game plan. Just keep rolling, keep bettering yourself, and hopefully it pays off this summer. I think it will, though. So good. surrounded by good people. I know, yourself. I know it will. You're going to freaking kill it. Yeah. Any Thank last you, words of advice to the listeners out there? Um, Last words of advice, I know we've been over it a bunch of times, but really don't be afraid to take that risk. Um, always listen to your gut because there's going to be every single person in the world is going to be chirping in your ear at some point telling you to do a certain thing. If you don't feel it inside yourself, then it's probably not the route that you should take. 